In this presentation, we will look at the book of Alma in chapters 13 through 16. So let's take a look at some of the doctrines and principles that are taught in Alma 13 through 16. First of all, we begin with Alma's chapter 13 through 16 and short introduction. You use your agency in the pre-earth life to make righteous choices and to prepare for mortality. As a result of your premortal righteousness, further blessings and opportunities have been prepared for you in mortality upon condition of your continued faithfulness. Note that Alma emphasized our need to be sanctified in mortality and to prepare for the ultimate goal of entering into the rest of the Lord. Remember that God's mercy and justice are greater than the wickedness of this world. In Ammonihah, those who repented and accepted the teachings of Alma received the Lord's blessings, even though many of them were cast out or destroyed. Amulek pleaded with Alma to petition the Lord to save the righteous from the actions of the wicked. Alma's explanation to Amulek, however, confirms the principle of agency and the blessings awaiting those who suffer for the gospel's sake. The wicked will receive God's justice either in this life or in the life to come. There are times that the Lord lets the wicked destroy the righteous so that it will condemn the wicked in the next life. And God will justly condemn them and bring his judgments upon them because of their destroying the wicked. Now, let's look at Alma chapter 13. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. In these verses, Alma details requisites for holding the holy priesthood that priest is known to our dispensation as the higher priesthood or Melchizedek priesthood. All that he says is equally descriptive of the manner in which the priesthood was or is always conferred, whether in the pre-earth life or immortality, the system of its conferral being one and the same in both cases. Thus, these verses can be profitably studied from either point of view. In the commentary that follows, the foreordination to the priesthood and pre-earth life is emphasized. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. The phrase, ordained priest, after his holy order, which was after the order of his son, meant, Alma referred to priests who were ordained after the order of his son. The phrase, after the order of his son, is a reference to the Melchizedek priesthood. In modern revelation, the Lord stated that before the days of Melchizedek, the priesthood was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. But out of respect or reverence to the name of God, the name was changed to the Melchizedek priesthood. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained why Alma 13, like many other passages in the Book of Mormon, does not distinguish between priests of the Aaronic priesthood and high priests of the Mel Pre Melchizedek priesthood. He said, quote, Book of Mormon prophets gave the title priest to officers known in the dispensation as high priests. That is, they were priests of the Melchizedek priesthood, or as Alma expressed it, the Lord God ordained priest after his holy order, which was after the order of the Son of God. End of quote. The Lord ordained priests after his holy order, whose duty it was to instruct in the things of God, those over whom they were called to preside. Another duty of the priests was to keep their charges continually char stirred up unto obedience to the laws and commandments which God had given them. In this way, by preachment and by example, the priests so set apart were able to guide and direct their brethren aright, and always to hold before them the proper manner by which they were to look forward to his son for redemption. Chapter 13, verse 2, the phrase, after the order of his son, meant, The holy priesthood is a minister to the children of men according to different orders. As Joseph Smith taught, quote, all priesthood is Melchizedek, but there are different portions or degrees of it, end of quote. The preparatory gospel, Law of Moses, operates under that order we know as Aaronic. 
the fullness of the everlasting gospel operates under a different order. The church operates under an ecclesiastical order or officers, offices, quorums, and councils. In our day, one enters into the patriarchal order in holy temples through entering into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. In addition, one enters into the holy order of God through provide, proving worthy of all the blessings of the temple, though eventually receiving what the scriptures call the fullness of the priesthood. President Ezra Taft Benson thus explained, quote, to enter into the order of the Son of God is equivalent today of entering into the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is only received in the house of the Lord, end of quote. Chapter 13, verses 3 through 5, the phrase called and prepared before the foundation of the world meant. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that those who are ordained to a calling in mortality were foreordained to that calling in the pre-earth life. He said, quote, Every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the grand, grand council of heaven before this world was. I suppose that I was ordained to this very office in that grand council. End of quote. Those who are called and prepared from the foundation of the world were chosen by God in the pre earth life because of their exceeding faith and good works. Can you see in the pre earth life, it's like mortality? You could have faith and strengthen your faith in the pre earth life, or you could not strengthen your faith. I have faith in Christ in the purest life. Again, it was up to your desires and what you decided to do. President Wilfred Rudolph taught that all of the elders of Israel who hold the Melchizedek priesthood were foreordained in addition to the prophets. Quote, Joseph Smith was appointed by the Lord before he was born as much as Jeremiah was. So I say with regard to Joseph Smith. He received his appointment from before the foundation of the world, and he came forth in the due time of the Lord to establish this work on the earth. And so it is the case with tens of thousands of the elders of Israel. The Lord Almighty has conferred upon you the holy priesthood and made you instruments in the hands to build up this kingdom. Do we contemplate these things as fully as we ought? Brothers and sisters, those of us who are ordained to the priesthood here on earth were ordained before we ever came to this earth. We were given the Melchizedek priesthood in the pre-earth life because of our faithfulness and our righteous obedience to the Father and His Son. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that both men and women were given assignments in the pre-earth life. Quote, in the world before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments, while faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood tasks. While we do not now remember the particulars, this does not alter the glorious reality of what we once agreed to. You are accountable for those things which long ago were expected of you, just as are those we sustain as prophets and apostles. Brothers and sisters, we agreed and made covenants to do certain things before we ever came down here. Now we are trying to prove that we are worthy of fulfilling those covenants we made before we ever came. I believe it was Orson Pratt who said that we may even have signed our names, literally signed our names to documents to the covenants we agreed to keep when we are in the pre-earth life. Elder Nele Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the responsibilities of God's children. God's children have immortality regardless of their chosen state in the pre-mortal life. Quote, pre-mortality is not a relaxing doctrine. For each of us, there are choices to be made, incessant and difficult chores to be done, ironies and adversities to be experienced, time to be well spent, talents and gifts to be well employed. Just because we were chosen there and then surely does not mean we can be indifferent here and now. Whether for nation for men or for designation for women, those called and prepared must also prove chosen and faithful. End of quote.
President Harold B. Lee described the source of some of the blessings we receive in this life. Quote, All these rewards were seemingly promised or foreordained before the world was. Surely these matters must have been determined by the kind of lives we had lived in that premortal spirit world. Some may question these assumptions, but at the same time they will accept without any question the belief that each one of us will be judged when we leave this earth according to his or her deeds during our lives here in mortality. Isn't it just as reasonable to believe that what we have received here in this earth life was given to each of us according to the merits of our conduct before we came here? Yes, it is just as reasonable. Just as the blessings I receive in the next life pertain to my obedience here, the blessings I receive here were given because of my obedience to the gospel in the pre-earth life and the doctrine of foreordination. Thus, as in the ground council in heaven, Christ was called and ordained to his earthly ministry. So were all who ministered in his first call and name first called in heavenly councils, where they too were ordained to the labors they would be theirs in mortality. None were called to offices for which they had not been properly prepared. In teaching this principle, Alma ref Amos's reference is to men like Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and many other faithful priesthood holders of the earth's early history. Modern Revelation uses as illustrations Joseph and Hiram Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, and Wilfred Woodruff. These, we are told, were among the noble and great ones who were chosen in the beginning to be rulers in the church of God, even before they were born. They, with many others, received their first lessons in the world of spirits and were prepared to come forth in the due time of the Lord, to labor in his vineyard for the salvation of the souls of men. Chapter 13, verse 3, the phrase, on account of their exceeding faith and good works, meant, those designated in heavenly councils as noble and great have proven themselves even in the pre-earth state. A state. To suppose that in our spirit existence prior to moral birth we walked exclusively by sight, never having to exercise faith, is to misunderstand the purpose of that existence as a training ground for mortality. Those born into this life with the gift of faith merited that blessing, for we are told that there is a law irrevocable to be decreed in heaven before the foundation of the world upon which all blessings are predicated. Good works were also requisite for such high and holy foreordinations. Surely there is no better preparation for exercising faith and doing good works in the second estate than actually exercising faith and doing good works in the first estate. Even though we lived by sight and saw the Father and the Son, we still had the agency to exercise faith in them or not to exercise faith. The Holy Father had seen his spirit children grow up from the very first. He could not but notice that some of them were slothful. Others were unmindful of his presence in every experience of their lives. They were at least cast out from the dwelling place of light, while still others proved to be firm and steadfast in doing his will. Always they sought for that which was greatest for his glory. Chapter 13, verse 3, the phrase, a preparatory redemption for such, meant all doctrines, ordinances, and powers associated with the gospel of Jesus Christ assume force and meaning only in and through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Such was the plan prepared before the foundation of the earth. Men are called to receive the priesthood to assist in the redemption of souls. They are called to preach and make available what Paul described as the ministry of reconciliation. They are called to bless lives, to lighten burdens, to straighten the feeble knees, and lift up the hands that hang down, just as their muster, the great high priest, is called upon to do. The priesthood bearers before and after Christ are thus involved in the work of his ministry. Their work is preparatory. 
They, like the preeminent forerunner John the Baptist, prepared the way of the Lord. Those prophets and priests who labored before the meridian of time sought to prepare mankind for the coming of the Redeemer. In the words of Elder Bruce R. McConkie, quote, They could preach redemption, they could foretell its coming, but their work was preparatory only. Redemption itself would come through the ministry of him of whom there was but types and shadows. End of quote. Those who have lived since that time seek to instruct and warn and exhort all, uh, exhort mankind all in preparation for his second advent, that final redemption of the earth and its inhabitants. Chapter 13, verse 4, the phrase agency existed in the prior, in the premortal world. And then the quote, thus they have been called to this holy calling on account of their faith, while others would reject the Spirit of God on account of the hardness of their hearts and blindness of their minds. This meant, how were those in the premortal world able to reject the Spirit of God? It's, yeah, especially when they saw him and he was there and they were living amongst him. Well, President Joseph Fielding Smith confirmed the eternal principle of agency as he answered this question, quote, God gave his children their free agency even in the pre-mortal spirit world by which the individual spirits had the privilege, just as men have here, of choosing the good and rejecting the evil or partaking of the evil to suffer the consequences of their sins. Because of this, some even there were more faithful than others in keeping the commandments of the Lord. The spirits of men had their free agency. The spirits of men were not equal. They may have had an equal start, and we know that they will all, were all innocent in the beginning, but the right of free agency which was given to them enabled some to outstrip others, and thus through the eons of immortal existence to become more intelligent, more faithful, for they were free to act for themselves, to think for themselves, to receive the truth or rebel against it. End of quote. It would be similar to the Pharisees during the time of Christ. Here they lived with the Son of God and saw him, yet they still rejected his gospel plan. So were there those in the premortal existence who lived with God the Father and saw his glory, but yet still rejected his gospel and did not live up or exercise faith. As spirits in the pre-earth life, we developed worthy characteristics that showed our abilities. God observed our progress and gave us responsibilities according to our faithfulness. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, During the ages in which we dwelt in the pre-mortal state, we not only developed our various characteristics and showed our worthiness and ability, or the lack of it, but we were also where such progress could be observed. It is reasonable to believe that there was a church organization there. The heavenly beings were living in a perfect, arranged society. Every person knew his place. Priesthood, without any question, had been conferred upon the leaders who were, cho were chosen to officiate. And the leaders were chosen to officiate. Ordinances pertaining to that pre-existence were required, and the love of God prevailed. Under such conditions, it was natural for our Father to discern and choose those who were most worthy and elevate the, the talents of each individual. He knew not only what each of us could do, but also what each of us would do when put to the test and when responsibility was given us. Then, when the time came for our habitation on mortal, mortal earth, all things were prepared, and the servants of the Lord chosen or ordained to the respective missions. End of quote. The eternal principle of free agency was their portion, and God's Spirit was their constant and faithful counselor. The spirits of men had power to know right from wrong and to choose good or evil, the satisfaction of which was concordant with their desires. They were taught the truth, and many of them followed its precepts. In so doing, the faithful and those who loved righteousness received strength, as also it made them leaders. Excuse me, leaders of others.
God magnified their strength and summoned them into his service. In short, certain spirits who had been faithful to him and his cause were called of God to be his rulers here upon earth and were further instructed in his ways. By their exceedingly great faith in his omnipotence and omniscience, they made themselves ready to perform whatsoever mission God in his wisdom required at their hands. So there was a lot of learning and growth going on in the pre-earth brothers and sisters. Things were just not automatically because we lived with God. We still had to choose. It is most important for us to remember that those who were called into his service were they that had established themselves in his favor by bringing forth good works through faith on his name. Others who by pride and in fact and infatuation had cast aside the law of the Lord and rejected his word became more and more estranged to the promptings of his, so his spirit. Thus they separated themselves from those who were diligent in keeping the Lord's commandments. We may surmise that if it had not been for their lack of perseverance in applying themselves to observing his laws, the indolent and those who chose evil might too have been privileged, as were their brethren, to hold offices in the holy priesthood of God and minister unto the children of men. And thus we see that it was when that it was then in the world of spirits the same as here below, a pattern, or better still, a type was established which fashioned the faithful and true. They, we might say, were advanced along the path of redemption, while others who chose evil and loitered along the way were hampered in their advancement by their folly and foolishness. So again, can't you see how pre-earth life is like earth life, except we did not have a body? We still had agency to choose. We could estrange ourselves from God and choose not to attend our church meetings and choose not to further grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know some went as far as to go and follow Satan rather than Christ. That's how far they abused their agency. 13 verse 4, the phrase hardness of hearts and blindness of their minds meant the voice of the Spirit speaks to us in our hearts and minds. Gospel understanding can be either heartless, can neither, can be neither heartless nor mindless. Neither feeling nor intellect stand alone is sufficient to bring the understanding and faith essential to salvation. Thus in the pre-earth life, those who rejected the fullness of the gospel blessings did it as it is done in mortality, that is, by ignoring the feelings of their hearts and by choosing the windows of their minds to light and, and by closing the windows of their minds to light and truth. So up there we could fill of the Spirit and be enlightened by the Spirit, or we could not. Again, how we used our agency. Chapter 13, verse 5, the phrase, In the first place they were on the same standing with their brethren, meant it would appear from this verse that the spirits of all men were created with equal capacity and opportunity to obtain the fullness of heaven's blessings. Yet some, long before they were born into mortality, closed their eyes and hardened their hearts to the plan of redemption. In the beginning, all spirits were created equal. They were, there were none more privileged than were others. All were nurtured at the side of our Heavenly Father. All were blessed with the capacity of learning. Heaven gave them love, and they themselves developed understanding. Wisdom came with understanding, while knowledge preceded them both. Knowledge quickly followed by understanding, and then by wisdom made strong the just and true. To the just and true, strength was added upon strength, just upon justice, faith upon faith. The strong became stronger. As the strong became stronger, the light of Christ illuminated their way, and in it they saw the reality of his atonement, who was the, the phrase who was prepared in reference to Christ meant, we are told that it was necessary for the earthly Christ to advance from grace to grace until he received the fullness of his Father. In so doing, he was but following the path and pattern of his pre-earth existence. Just as we learn line upon line, grace upon grace, here in mortality, we learned 
line upon line, grace to grace, grace for grace, precept upon precept in our pre-earth life existence. Chapter 13, verse 6, the phrase, thus being called by this holy calling, meant we do not vie for office or position in the kingdom of God. All who serve, all who hold the priesthood, or any ecclesiastical office must be called of God. There are no self-ordinations. All are called by God. That Alma referred to the priesthood as a holy calling is most appropriate and descriptive. The rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, Joseph Smith said, and the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. Thus the prophet declared that the scepter of the priesthood must be an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. The word ordained meant invested with authority by the laying on of hands by one who has authority. The phrase, the high priesthood of the holy order of God. There are two meanings of the title high priest. First, high priest is one of the ordained offices in the Melchizedek priesthood. Second, God's chief representative on earth, the one who holds the highest spiritual position in his kingdom in any age is called the high priest. This special designation of the chief spiritual officer of the church has reference to the administrative position which he holds rather than to the office to which he is ordained in the priesthood. The phrase to teach his commandments meant Joseph Smith taught, quote, the duty of a high priest is to administer in spiritual and holy things and to hold communion with God. And again, it is the high priest's duty to be better qualified to teach principles or doctrines than the elders, end of quote. Thus, the primary charge of the high priest, indeed the primary responsible of those who hold the higher priesthood, is teaching the doctrines of salvation. A revelation of our day states that the greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the ministries of the kingdom, even the kingdom of the knowledge of God. The Melchizedek priesthood, Joseph Smith taught, quote, is the channel through which all knowledge, doctrines, the plan of salvation, and every important matter is revealed from heaven, end of quote. And that is regardless of gender. All revelation we receive. All knowledge and doctrines will be revealed through the priesthood. The power and authority of the priesthood and the direction of the Father through the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ. Chapter 13, verse 7, the phrase, This high priesthood being after the order of his Son, meant Christ is the pattern, the standard, the exemplar in all things. In heavenly councils, he was called and ordained to his holy ministry on account of his exceedingly great faith and good works in that first estate. He compi complied fully with the dis discipline and order of that heavenly kingdom. All who held the priesthood before the day of his mortal ministry were to be types and shadows of what he would be and do as he labored in mortality. Their ordination and ministry were to be living prophecies of his own. In like manner, all who have been called to the holy priesthood since the day of his coming in the flesh are to serve as he served, imitating his example in all that they do. They are to be living witnesses of what he was. In chapter 7, the phrase without beginning of days or ends of years meant this phrase, commonly associated with descriptions of the Melchizedek priesthood, is intended to dramatize its endless duration. The priesthood, like Christ, is from eternity past to eternity future. It exists before days were numbered upon this earth and will continue throughout the endless expanse of eternity. From the earliest of times it was understood that the holy order came, not by man nor the will of man, neither by father or mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. And it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his, God's, own will, unto as many as believe on his name. Now, the phrase, neither by father and mother, meaning you do not receive the Melchizedek priesthood because of lineage. That, like the Aaronic priesthood under the law of Moses, the lineage of the Levites 
had the Aaronic priesthood, only that lineage did. But the Melchizedek priesthood is given by ordination and calling of God, not by lineage. Chapter 13, verses 8 through 9, the declaration of the preceding verses is now summarized. To hold the priesthood, one must be called of God. It is not a matter of self-choice. Righteousness is a prerequisite to its conferral, and it must be conveyed according to the order of the church, that is, by the laying on of hands, which the priesthood of God is conferred, and office in the priesthood is given is given is a holy ordinance which is upheld by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thus all who receive the priesthood must receive it in the same manner as Christ received it, and are to be types or witnesses of him, sharing a power which is endless as God himself. Brothers and sisters, how are we doing in becoming types and witnesses of Christ, especially brethren, those of us who hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Chapter 13, verse 10, the phrase, there were many who were ordained and became high priest of God, meant Alma taught that there were many who were called in the pre-earth life because of their exceeding faith. He pled with his brethren to exercise faith again and to bring forth fruit to receive their blessings. President Harold B. Lee explained that although many were called and foreordained in the premortal life because of their valiance, they must exercise faith and good works during mortality to realize the full blessings of their calling. He said, quote, God may have called and chosen men in the spirit world or in their first estate to do a certain work, but whether they will accept that calling here and magnify it by faithful service and good works while immortality is a matter in which it is their right and privilege to exercise their free agency to choose good or evil. I fear there are many among us who, because of their faithfulness in the spirit world, were called to do a great work here, but, like reckless spendthrifts, they are exercising their free agency in riotous living and are losing their birthright and the blessings that were the, theirs had they proved faithful to their calling. Hence, as the Lord has said, there are many called, but few are chosen. End of quote. Chapter 13, verses 11 through 12, the phrase, and were sanctified, meant Alma taught that many became clean through the blood of the Lamb and were sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Once sanctified, they could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. However, even after a person has been sanctified and has felt, and, and has felt cleansed by the Holy Ghost, he or she will continue to be tempted throughout mortality. Modern revelation warns, therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Just because we become sanctified doesn't mean we automatically then are kept from temptation. No, we can lose that sanctification by using our agency wrong and choosing to choose evil. President Brigham Young defines sanctification as follows, quote, I will put my own definition to the term sanctification and say it consists in overcoming every sin and bringing all into subjection to the law of Christ. God has placed in us a pure spirit. When this, the spirit, reigns predominant without let or hindrance and triumphs over the flesh and rules and governs and controls, this I call the blessing of sanctification. Will sin be perfectly destroyed? No, it will not, for it is not so designed in the economy of heaven. Do not suppose that we shall ever in the flesh be free from temptation to sin. Some suppose that they can in the flesh be sanctified body and spirit and become so pure that they will never again feel the effects of the power of the adversary of truth. Were it possible for a person to attain to this degree of perfection in the flesh, he could not die. Neither would remain in a world where sin predominates. Sin has entered into the world, and death by sin. I think we shall more or less feel the effects of sin so long as we live, and finally have to pass the ordeals of death. That's why it says we must endure to the end. We will always constantly feel the effects of temptation and sin in this world and must always be watchful 
and mindful and careful. Alma, speaking more than a hundred years before the ministry of Christ, observed that many had exercised exceeding faith, repented of their sins, and lived righteously. These, he said, were ordained to the holy order, were sanctified and washed their garments white through the blood of the Lamb. Those magnifying their callings in the priesthood in our day have been promised that by so doing, they too are sanctified the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. By the magnifying of our callings, that is, by serving faithfully where and as we are called to serve, we sanctify ourselves, and this is regardless of gender. Sanctification is the process of becoming clean, pure, and spotless before the Lord. That process involves faithful service, which in turn is essential to the remission of sin and the refining of our souls. Applying this principle, James wrote that, quote, If any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. End of James' quote. James' point is that the sins being hidden are those of the minister, not just those of the one being ministered to. Commenting on this verse, Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, By reclaiming an erring brother, we save both him and ourselves. Our sins are hidden, remitted, because we minister for the salvation and blessings of another member of the kingdom. In principle, this special reward for Christ's ministers applies also to those who preach the gospel and bring souls into the kingdom. The minister is rewarded with salvation and of necessity, and the process is freed from his own sins. End of quote. What a great blessing and a great reason why we should share the gospel. The whole concept of priesthood revolves around this doctrine. Men are entrusted with the priesthood so that they may serve and bless others. Through faithfulness in this divine investiture of authority, they sanctify their own souls, that they lay up the blessings of heaven in store, that they perish not, but bring a salvation to their own souls. The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier. The sanctified soul is one that has been baptized of water and of the Spirit. The Spirit baptism is frequently referred to in the Holy Writ as the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. In it is the work of the Holy Ghost to burn out of the repentant soul the dross or iniquity, carnality, sensuality, and evil in any form. The persons thus cleansed become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. They are born again. Brothers and sisters, this chapter 13 is a great treatise on the priesthood and receiving the Melchizedek priesthood and those who received it here received it before we came. Please, sisters, do not mistake and think that this chapter does not apply to you. Your test and challenges will be whether you sustain and support the priesthood. Satan will try to get us to argue why women do not hold Melchizedek priesthood offices. Instead of quarreling over who receives what authority and what priesthood, let us accept the callings that God has ordained to either gender and then succeed in those and show him that we are faithful and humble no matter what calling he has given. Have you noticed that I as a man cannot have children? Do you want to know why? It's because I don't have the authority to have children. Sisters, you have the authority or priesthood of God to bear children. So I think God gets very offended when we complain about which priesthood he gives to who and what authority and offices he gives to who. May we be faithful in the offices he has given each gender. The baptism of fire is not something in addition to the receipt of the Holy Ghost. Rather, it is the actual enjoyment of the gift which is offered by the laying on of hands at the time of baptism. Remission of sins, the Lord says, comes by baptism and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. Those who receive the baptism of fire are filled as if with fire. Again, both genders, this is a blessing that can be given to either one. 
Sanctification is a state of saintliness, a state attained only by conformity to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, regardless of gender. The plan of salvation is the system and means provided whereby men may sanctify their souls and thereby become worthy of a celestial inheritance. Chapter 13, verse 12, the phrase, there were many exceedingly, there were many exceedingly great many meant when the righteous in paradise, those assured of a glorious resurrection, assembled to greet the Christ during their short ministry among them, they constituted an innumerable company. The number of the faithful saints who lived from the time of Adam to the time when Christ visited the world of the spirits appears to have been appreciably greater than we have generally supposed. Though it is true that the gate is straight and the way of holiness is narrow, the few there be that find it. Presumably, a relative expression may well total in real terms a large number of Heavenly Father's children who will go on to exaltation in the highest heaven. There is no ceiling on the number of saved being. God's desire to save all who will be saved. It's up to us whether we want to be. So what he is saying is there will be many, millions upon millions that will be exalted in the celestial kingdom. But compared to the total number that have been on the earth, it will be relatively few. Chapter 13, verses 14 through 19, Melchizedek, the great high priest. The high priest, Melchizedek, holds a place of great respect among Latter-day Saints. Alma noted that the importance of Melchizedek when he said none were greater. Who was this great prophet? Melchizedek lived about 2000 BC and was the high priest and king of Salem, or Jerusalem. He was the presiding priesthood authority in his day and was the one Abraham paid tithings to. When Melchizedek was called, when Melchizedek was a child, he feared God and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. Although he is mentioned only briefly in the Bible, modern revelation confirms he was a man of great faith. Because of Melchizedek's righteousness, his ministry foreshadowed the ministry of Jesus Christ and thus became the namesake of the higher priesthood. Salem is supposed to be the ancient name of the city of Jerusalem, and many students believe it to mean peace. As Melchizedek established peace in his kingdom that lasted all the days of his life, he was called the Prince of Peace. We can better understand why this name was given him when we remember the royal position which he held in addition to him being called the High Priest of God's Church. He reigned as King of Salem. Under his father, who were many, who we may imagine was king of the whole land, whose capital was Salem. Thus Melchizedek, being a prince by birth and reigning in the city of peace, we can readily see why he was given that name, Prince of Peace. Melchizedek, Hebrew Melik Sadiq, means king of righteousness. Though the present verses contain the only references to Melchizedek in the Book of Mormon, we can be confident that the plates of brass provided Alma with appreciably more information than our Bible contains. From the Joseph Smith translation, we learn and suppose Alma to have known that Melchizedek was a man of faith who wrought righteousness and who, even as a child, stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. He was approved of God and was ordained a high priest after the order of the Son of God. He and his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven, meaning that they were caught up like Enoch and his people and obtained the promise that they would return with them during the millennial day. Thus, he was also called the King of Heaven by his people, or in other words, the King of Peace. You can see how Melchizedek is a type of the Savior. The Savior is the King of Peace. Melchizedek was a King of Peace. This Melchizedek, as we have noted, received the higher priesthood or God's holy order through a holy ordinance, administered at the hands of his fathers, even from the Noah down to his day, and from Noah until Enoch through the lineage of their fathers, and from Enoch to Abel, who was slain by the conspiracy of his brother, who received the priesthood by the commandments of God by the hand of his father Adam, who was the first man. 
Thus we see a direct line of succession in the holy priesthood, which followed the faithful even from Father Adam down to Melchizedek, who was a high priest in God's holy order. The Church of God in those days kept, as it does now, a complete record of them that hold the holy priesthood. I'm sorry, the high priesthood. In this way, or through it, we see that there are always those in every dispensation of the gospel bear witness of Jesus Christ and of his atoning sacrifice. Through the testimony of these high priests, men in every age of the world have been taught to glorify the holy name of God by repentance and continual faith in him, whereby they might gain a remission of their sins. Before the Savior's birth in the land of Jerusalem, the inhabitants of the earth look forward to his coming. We look back. Both views are equally e efficacious, and in them men can see the right way to enter into the rest of the Lord. Chapter 13, verses 17 through 19. Melchizedek was a type for Christ. In these verses, Alma establishes Melchizedek as a type for Christ, noticing the following parallels. First, like Christ, he was a king. The very name of this great high priest, Melchizedek, meaning king of righteousness, or perhaps more correctly, my king is righteous, affirms and testifies of the goodness and power of the coming Messiah. Righteousness is also a name title of Christ. As Melchizedek ruled his kingdom in righteousness, so Christ will eventually rule and reign upon this earth, doing so with the unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, possessing an everlasting dominion without compulsory means. Second, Melchizedek ruled over the city of Salem, a name which means peace. In like manner, Christ will reinstitute the glory of David's day when naught is known but peace among the Lord's people. Third, both Melchizedek and Christ were known as the great high priest. The Old Testament time, the primary duty of the high priest was to offer sacrifice at the altar and to act as mediator between God and man. It was by virtue of the priestly functions that the nation of Israel were reconciled to their God. Through the ministrations of the priesthood, the people of the Israel were instructed in the doctrine of sin and its expiation, in forgiveness and worship. In short, the priest was the indispensable source of religious knowledge for the people and the channel through which spiritual life was communicated. Fourth, both were men of mighty faith who taught repentance to their people. Of Melchizedek who created, his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven. And of course, the same will be true of all who sustain Christ in his teachings in righteousness. Fifth, both bore the title Prince of Peace, being teachers of that gospel by which peace and joy come. Sixth, of Melchizedek we read, and he did reign under his father, as does Christ, who pro professed no authority save that of his father. Seventh, Though there were many prophets before Melchizedek, many after him, Alma described the king of Salem by saving none were greater. Thus this great prophet, priest, and king stood as a classic type of the promised Messiah of whom it is true, not only that none were greater, but also that none have been as great. Chapter 13, verse 20, the phrase, what does it mean to rest in the scriptures? The dictionary defines rest as to twist, to distort, to turn from truth, or twist from its natural meaning, to pervert. Thus, those who rest the scriptures change or distort the actual meaning to match their own personal opinion or interpretation. Those who manipulate the scriptures or stir up contention are inspired by Satan. The fate of those who rest the scriptures is their own destruction. From the time of the first copy of the Book of Mormon was published, all who come in possession of its sacred truths must accept or reject them at the peril of their eternal lives. We cannot reject the mind, the will, the word of the Lord, and at the same time make legitimate claim to accepting him. As it is with the Book of Mormon, so it is with all scripture, be it ancient or modern. We cannot with impunity close our hearts and minds to that which the Lord has said, or to that which he will yet say. Some profess to accept the voice of heaven, but only after having distorted its purpose to suit their own. Peter, like Alma, warned that the spiritually untutored and unstable who rest, that is, twist or distort the scriptures, do so to their own destruction. 
Common practices among those who abuse the rest of scriptures include one, designating the literal as figurative and the figurative as literal. Two, stretching a text beyond what is meant, that is to justify actions that assuredly the text did not intend. Three, squeezing a text so tightly that no appropriate application can be made from it. Four, granting some obscure passage the power and authority to overturn the plain meaning of a host of other texts. And five, picking and choosing from holy writ that's what suits their fancy while reading all else with a blind eye. Chapter 13, verse 21, the phrase, the day of salvation. In one sense, reference is to the day of the Savior's birth. In another sense, to say the day of salvation draws nigh is to lay stress on the importance of preparing in this life for death, that night of darkness wherein there can no labor, no where can be no labor performed. Chapter 13, verses 22 to 26, the phrase, the reality of angels. The Book of Mormon testifies to the authenticity and purpose of angels. In reference to the reality of angels, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, quote, I am convinced that one of the profound themes of the Book of Mormon is the role and prevalence and central participation of angels in the gospel story. One of the things that will become more important in our lives the longer we live is the reality of angels, their work, and their ministry. I refer here not alone to Angel Moroni, but also to those more personal ministering angels who are with us and around us, empowered to help us, and who do exactly that. I believe we need to speak of and believe in and bear testimony of the ministry of angels more than we sometimes do. They constitute one of God's great methods of witnessing through the veil, and no document in all the world teaches that principle so clearly and so powerfully as does the Book of Mormon. End of quote. The proclamation of angels is one of the means by which the gospel is preached. Of the Adamic dispensation, the scriptures attest, and thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning. Be being declared by holy angels sent from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Angels seen and unseen witnessed to the chosen vessels about the divine. Sonship of the Lord Jesus, and these in turn bear witness to the residue of men. Indeed, whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. Chapter 13, verse 28. You will not be tempted above that which ye can bear. In verse 28, that phrase, present bringing on taught of the constant battle we wage against sin, Satan and sin. The men and women who desire to obtain seats in the celestial kingdom will find that they must battle with the enemy of all righteousness every day. End of quote. Each of us must choose, actively choose to avoid and to resist temptation. Alma taught that we must watch and pray continually to avoid being tempted above that which we can bear. The Apostle Paul also declared that God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Well, what is the escape? It is faith in and reliance on the Savior and his atonement. As Alma says, be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love and long suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that you shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts. By following Alma's counsel in Alma 13:28, we will always be able to resist temptation. Elder M. Russell Ballard gave this important counsel, quote, I understand the struggles you face every day in keeping the commandments of the Lord. The battle for your souls is increasingly fierce. The adversary is strong and cunning. However, you have within your physical body the powerful spirit of a son or daughter of God. Because he loves you and wants you to come home to him, our Father in heaven has given you a conscience that tells your spirit when you are keeping the Lord's commandments and when you are not. If you will pay more attention 
to your spiritual self, which is eternal, then to your mortal self, which is temporary, you can always resist the temptations of Satan and conquer his efforts to take you into his power. Brothers and sisters, be careful to not quote, God will not suffer you to be tempted more than you're able to bear, and then that's all you quote. Remember, Paul said he will provide an escape, which escape is Jesus Christ and his atonement. What happens if you do not take that escape and you do not pay more attention to your spiritual self? Then you will be tempted more than you are able to bear in this mortal life. So we can become tempted more than we're able to bear if we do not take the escape. May we have the wisdom and the intelligence to take the escape, which is Jesus Christ. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 14. Chapter 14, 2 through 5. But the more part of them were desirous that they might destroy Alma and Amulek. When the servants of falsehood contend with the servants of truth, each side must fight with its own weapons. The servants of light cannot use falsehoods to advance their cause, nor can the servants of the prince of darkness use truth, though they may appear to do so. Truth without light, truth without virtue, truth without goodness, truth without mercy, truth without righteousness, truth without holiness. This is truth without honesty. Like the dusk of day, it is, it is harbinger of the darkness to come. Chapter 14, verses 6 through 7, the phrase, his soul began to be hollowed up under a consciousness of his own guilt. Knowing that he has employed lying words, Zizram's consciousness is stung by the doctrines taught and the testimony borne. His effort to right the matter by defending Alma and Amulek, however, is rewarded in the same spirit in which previously he sought to abuse and confound them. Might we say that Satan is no respecter of persons, that he will turn with equal wrath upon one and all who oppose him? The phrase, and they did cast them out and sent men to cast stones at them. The black ignorance into which these people had sunk had now robbed them of all spiritual perception. In the degradation of their condition, they considered no other alternative than the destruction of the men who had stripped them of their tattered shreds of self-justification and exposed their shameful wickedness. Chapter 14, verses 8 through 11, the martyrdom of the righteous. Through the power of the priesthood he held and his faith, Alma had the ability to deliver the faithful women and children of Ammonihah from their terrible death. The Lord did not permit him to do so, however. Alma explained to Amalek that the Lord would receive the righteous martyrs unto himself as a testimony against the evil acts of their persecutors. And maybe that's why we see some of horrible things done to righteous people to today, that God can then use that as a testimony against the wicked who caused those evil acts in the next life. While serving in the 70, Elder Ronald E. Pullman affirmed that at times the Lord permits the righteous to suffer when others exercise agency and unrighteousness. Quote, Adversity in the lives of the obedient and faithful may be the consequence of disease, accidental injury, ignorance, or the influence of the adversary. To preserve free agency, the Lord also at times permits the righteous to suffer the consequences of evil acts by others. End of quote. Remember, the wicked have agency also, and God does not destroy them of their agency. Even the wicked have agency. Certainly, we grieve to consider the deaths of the righteous who suffer at the hands of the wicked, but we rejoice in knowing of their rewards in the spirit world, as well as their final estate in the celestial kingdom. Doctrine and Covenants 4246 reminds us Quote, those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. Unquote. This does not mean that there is no pain involved in the death of the righteous, but that the eternal rewards for them are so great that in comparison their pains are nothing. 
President Joseph F. Smith explained, quote, It is true I am weak enough to weep at the death of my friends and kindred. I may shed tears when I see the grief of others. I have sympathy in my soul for the children of men. I can weep with them when they weep. I can rejoice with them when they rejoice. But I have no cause to mourn, nor to be sad because death comes into the world. All fear of this death has been removed from the Latter-day Saints. They have no dread of the temporal death because they know that as death came upon them by the transgression of Adam, so by the righteousness of Jesus Christ shall life come unto them. And through death, and through they die, and, and though they die, they shall live again. Possessing this knowledge, they have joy even in death, for they know that they shall rise again and shall meet again beyond the grave. End of quote. When the righteous and innocent suffer, some become critical or lose faith. President Spencer W. Kimber offered the following counsel for when we witness suffering. Quote, if we look at mortality as the whole of existence, then pain, sorrow, failure, and short life would be calamity. But if we look upon life as an eternal thing stretching far into the pre-mortal past and on into the eternal post-death, future, then all happenings may be put in proper perspective. Is there not wisdom in his giving us trials that we might rise above them, responsibilities that we might achieve work, might achieve work to harden our muscles, sorrows to try our souls? Are we not exposed to temptations to test our strength, sickness that we might learn patience, death that we might be immortalized and glorified? If all the sick for whom we prayed were healed, if all the righteous were protected and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled and the basic principles of the gospel free agency would be ended. No man would have to live by faith. If joy and peace and rewards were instantaneously given the doer of good, there could be no evil. All would do good, but not because of the righteousness of doing good. There would be no test of strength, no development of character, no growth of powers, no free agency, only satanic controls. Should all prayers be immediately answered according to our own selfish desires and our limited understanding, then there would be little or no suffering, sorrow, disappointment, or even death. And if these were not, there would also be no joy, success, resurrection, no eternal life, and godhood. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, we have to suffer and experience the opposites of all things. God is not the author of evil, yet within limits and bounds he allows it to exist. This is done so that the righteous might merit a fullness of his glory, and that the wicked, the workers of evil, might in like fashion merit the fullness of his wrath. Suffering sanctifies the souls of the faithful. The inflicting of that suffering souls, all that is decent, and makes the pre preparatory pre and makes the per preparator a fit companion to the devil to merit as he has merited and to be rewarded as he will be rewarded. Mocking and scourging, bonds and imprisonment, flight and refuge, destitution and torment have been the common lot of saints in all ages. Yet that God who is not unmindful of the sparrow that falls has witnessed it all. He, having provided some better thing for them through their suffering, for without suffering they could not be made perfect. 14, verse 8, the phrase, They brought forth their records and cast them into the fire. This is one of the evidences in the Book of Mormon that many, if not most, of the believers had scriptural records. Though there may have been only one set of metal plates, such as the brass plates, surely hundreds and thousands of other sets of records, copy, copies less durable, but more accessible could be found among the descendants of Lehi. Chapter 14, verse 13, the phrase, Our work is not finished, therefore they burn us not. It will be remembered that Abinadi told the wicked priest of King Noah's court that they were without the power to slay him until he had delivered his message. This is the principle that Alma is teaching Amulek. When the Lord gives a servant a mission, that person is expected to have full confidence that he will enjoy the protection of heaven in the accomplishment of that which he has been called to do. 
chapter 14, verses 14 through 22. As men filled with the Spirit of God have conducted themselves with decorum and dignity in all ages and among all people with whom they have labored, so those filled with the Spirit of the devil have manifested the same un ugliness of spirit whenever they have appeared on the scene. How similar these devils incarnate were to those who mocked the Christ. He too was smitten upon the cheek gnashed at and spat upon. He, too, was artfully questioned by unscrupulous and double-tongued lawyers and priests. He, too, chose to remain silent rather than dignify their cunning inquisition with answers. And he, too, was taunted for not having the power to save himself from the agonies of the cross. Well might we say that the Savior and those that come in his name have received light treatment in all ages. One paragraph from the experience of the prophet Joseph Smith will illustrate the point. The constable who served the second warrant upon me had no sooner arrested me than he began to abuse and insult me. And so unfeeling was he with me that although I had been kept all the day in court without nothing to eat since the morning, yet he hurried me off to Broome County, a distance about 15 miles, before he allowed me any kind of food whatsoever. He took me to a tavern and gathered in a number of men who used every means to abuse ridicule and insult me. They spat upon me, pointed their fingers at me, proph saying, prophesy, prophesy. And thus they did imitate those who crucified the Savior of mankind, not knowing what they did. Even Joseph knows what Christ went through. And equally, Christ knows what Joseph went through. Chapter 14, verse 24, the phrase, if you have the power of God, deliver yourselves, man. These words of the chief judge immediately bring to mind the language of his master in his attempts to entice the Savior to improper use of heavenly powers. If thou be the Son of God, he taunted, command that these stones be made bread. And again, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from the pinnacle of the temple of the pinnacle and angels will bear thee up. The phrase, then we will believe. Of one thing we have perfect assurance. The last thing wanted by those who demand signs is signs. The last thing wanted by those who demand evidence is evidence. A world of signs and evidence would not soften their hearts. The leaders of the Jews sought signs and Christ gave them signs sufficient to convince any people. Yet they rejected him. And so it continues today. Chapter 14, verses 25 through 28, the deliverance of Alma and Amulek. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles used the story of Alma and Amulek to illustrate that the Lord will deliver us from our afflictions, but only after we have proven our faith by submitting to his quote, his will. Quote, Help from the Lord always follows eternal law. The better you understand that law, the easier it is to receive his help. The example of Ammon and Amulek is enlightening. While striving to do good among the people of Ammonihah, they were taken captive. Amulek trusted his more seasoned companion, Alma, who led him to greater confidence in the Lord. Forced to observe women and children consumed by fire, Amulek said, Perhaps they will burn us also. Alma answered, Be it according to the will of the Lord, a vital principle. But our work is not finished, therefore they burn us not. The chief judge and others and others over many days smote, spit upon, starved, questioned, and harassed them with marking words and threats. Though commanded to speak, they were stood bound and naked in silence, waiting patiently for the Lord to inspire them to act. Then the power of God was upon Alma and Amulek, and they arose. Alma cried, Give us strength according to our faith, which is in Christ, even unto deliverance. And they broke the cords with which they were bound. The earth shook, the prison walls were rent, all who smote Alma and Amulek were slain, and they were freed. The Lord will give relief with divine power when you seek deliverance in humility and faith in Christ. End of quote. And may I add, and do so in patience. It may take time. Let's now go to Alma chapter 15. 
15 verses 3 through 12, Zizram's mighty change. The change in Zizram demonstrates the love God has for each of his children and shows his willingness to forgive those who covenant to follow his son. Zizram was a deceitful lawyer in the city of Ammonihah who used his position to accuse Ammon Amalek and to destroy that which was good. Zizram's deception was revealed, however, and he began to tremble under a consciousness of his guilt. He changed from an antagonist to a sincere investigator. When Alman Amulek arrived in the city of Sidon, they found Zizram suffering great tribulations of his mind on account of his wickedness. But as a repentant believer, Zizram was healed according to his faith in Christ, was baptized, and became a powerful preacher from that time forth. Years later, Zizram served a mission with Alman Amulek among the Zoramites. Chapter 15, verses 3 through 5, the phrase, Sins harrowed up the mind of Zizram. While repenting and seeking forgiveness, Zizram's spirit and mind had been harrowed up and became exceedingly sore. President Boy K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of the reality of spiritual disorders that can cause powerful suffering. Quote, there is another part of us, not so tangible, but quite as real as our physical body. This intangible part of us is described as mind, emotion, intellect, temperament, and many other things. Very seldom is it described as spiritual. But there is a spirit in man. To ignore it is to ignore reality. There are spiritual disorders too, and spiritual diseases that can cause intense suffering. The body and the spirit of man are bound together. Often, very often, when there are disorders, it is very difficult to tell which is which. End of quote. Chapter 15, verse 3, the phrase, Zizram lay sick with a burning fever. The Savior taught that there is not necessarily a tie between sin and natural disaster, that a person's being persecuted or plagued or costly pummeled with calamity and tragedy is no reason to suppose that he or she is guilty of transgression against God or his laws. Joseph Smith explained, it is a false idea that the saints will escape all the judgments while the wicked suffer, for all flesh is subject to suffer, and the righteous shall hardly escape. Still, many of the saints will escape, for the just shall live by faith. Yet many of the righteous shall fall a prey to disease, to pestilence, etc., by reason of the weakness of the flesh, and yet be saved in the kingdom of God. So that is an unhallowed principle to say that such and such have transgressed because they have been preyed upon by disease or death. For all flesh is subject to death, and the Savior has said, Judge not, lest ye be judged. So just because we suffer from some disease, mal malady, or death does not mean that was a cause of because of sin. The physical and spiritual are inseparably connected. We cannot do despite to the spiritual without at the same time damaging the physical. When a person sins against light, when he or she wantonly goes at cross purposes to the ways of the Lord and sets at naught honor and decency and conscience and principles, that person does damage to the soul of which the physical part is an integral, the physical body is an integral part. When Jesus of Nazareth commanded the infirm of body to rise up and further declared, Thy sins be forgiven thee, his enemies accused him of blasphemy. The master asked simply, Does it require more power to forgive sins than to make the sick to rise up and walk? That is to say, the same power by which death is rebuked or elements are cured is able to rebuke the evil one and curse a sin-sick soul and to cure a sin-sick soul. In like manner, if one has the faith to be healed physically, he has the faith by which that cleansing and healing power can work a spiritual miracle and purify him from the stains of sin. Chapter 15, verse 6, the phrase, Believest thou in the power of Christ unto salvation? Our faith always and forever must be in the Son of God and through him in the Eternal Father. We never place our trust absolutely in man, even a good man. Zizram's faith needed to be in Christ, the Lord, not in Alma, not even in that power Alma possessed. The power unto life and salvation is in Christ, the person, and in none else. 
Chapter 15, verse 16, the phrase, He, Zizram, being rejected by those who were once his friends, and also by his father and his kindred. Here we learn of one of the sad but ever-present realities of membership in Christ's church. There is a price to be paid. The word of truth is sharper and powerful than a two-edged sword. It is no respecter of persons, nor does its cutting power stop short of tender and dear relations. Surely no one wants families to be forever joined and united more than Jesus. No one wants father, mother, brother and sister, parents and child, families to be close and at peace more than the Christ. And yet the Lord highlights a less than pleasant point that gospel living costs something, even occasionally the loss of family and friends. It may result in division and variance. Elder Gordon B. Hinckley spoke of meeting a young naval officer from Asia. The officer had not been a Christian, but during training in the United States, he had learned about the church and was baptized. He was now preparing to return to his native land. President Hinckley asked the officer, Your people are not Christians. What will happen to you when you return home a Christian, and more particularly, a Mormon Christian? The officer's faith face clouded, and he replied, My family will be disappointed, as my future and my career all opportunity may be foreclosed against me. President Hinckley asked, Are you willing to pay so great a price for the gospel? With his dark eyes moistened by tears, he answered with the question, It's true, isn't it? President Hinckley responded, Yes, it is true. To which the officer replied, Then what else matters? Brothers and sisters, what else matters than the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected? Nothing else matters. Let's now go to our last chapter, Alma chapter 16. Chapter 16, verses 2 through 3 and then 9 through 10, the words of Alma were all fulfilled. Alma pleaded with great anxiety from the innermost part of his heart for the people of Ammonihah to repent. As their prophet, Alma warned them to repent or be utterly destroyed from off the face of the earth. The Lord has promised to fulfill all the words of his prophets. Doc, <clears throat> Doc, to fulfill all the words of his prophets, documents the fulfillment of words of Alma by recording of those who rejected the prophets and executed the incident. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Alma 6, 2 through 3 and 9 through 10 documents the fulfillment of the words of Alma by recording the destruction of those who rejected the prophets and executed the innocent. This is one reason for scripture to teach us that all of God's words will be fulfilled, whether to our condemnation or eternal joy, depending on how we have exercised our agency. Thus, we can put our complete trust and faith in Christ, for he will keep his word to the children of men. Brothers and sisters, if Christ and Jehovah kept his word in times past, we can then be sure he will keep them in times present and in times future. Apparently, there are some situations in which divine judgment and punishment must be similarly, similarly rendered. Presumably, this is for the reason that since men do not act in a vacuum, their evil acts usually prove injurious to others as well as to themselves. There have been numerous instances, therefore, where God has visited destruction on the heads of wicked kings and rulers, armies and cities, and entire nations, for he no longer can permit their sinfulness to thwart fruitation of his plans, fruition of his plans. Listen again to the lamentation of the Savior over the impending destruction of Jerusalem, which was, the, which was to result from the Jews' willful rejection of their king and their persecution of the citizens of his kingdom. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Chapter 16, verses 5 through 6. Zoram inquires of Alma. God had promised to lead his people in battle when their cause is just, and many a prophet 
has stood at the head of the army of Israel. It was also the practice of the leaders of this people in ancient times to obtain the blessings and directions of heaven prior to going to war. In harmony with that tradition, Zoram seeks to learn from Alma, who he knows has the spirit of prophecy, where the Lamanites have taken their Nephite captives in the wilderness. His inquiry is rewarded as the Lord reveals that information to Alma. Thus we too can be guided and directed by God's prophets in our battles with Satan by giving heed unto the words of God's anointed leaders. Chapter 16, verse 11, Desolation of Nehor's Meant. The desolation of the city of Ammonihah is an important part of the message of the Book of Mormon. Ammonihah and Nehor are symbols, history as prophecy. Ammonihah and Nehor were to the nation of the Nephites what the Book of Mormon is to us, a warning voice. They were types casting shadows upon the cities of Zarahemla, Moroni, Moronihah, Gilgal, Anihah, Mokum, Jerusalem, Gidgadani, Gidomona, Jacob, Gibgimono, Jacobha, Laman, Josh, Gad, and Kishkuman, all of which, like Nehor, had the blood of the prophets and the saints upon their hands, and all of which were destroyed before the coming of Christ to the Nephites in the Meridian Dispensation. How perfect the type! Ammonihah, a city pretending religion, a religion perfectly tolerant of any action, save it be the preaching of the gospel of repentance. To preach repentance, to testify of Christ, to speak of the necessity of good works, these were sins too grievous to be borne. Their effect was to unite in wrath the bitterness, the diversified factions within the congregations of this ever-tolerant religion. These missionaries of righteousness must be mocked, ridiculed, beaten, and imprisoned. Their adherents must be stoned, driven from the community, or burned at the stake. Such were the seeds they planted, and such was the harvest they reaped in the desolation of Nehors. We are left to wonder to what extent Ammonihah is a prophetic foreshadowing of, what, of that which the scriptures denominate as the desolation of abomination, events that will proceed and attend the coming of the Lord and Master, that will bring again that peace once known to the faithful Nephite, nation. Chapter 16, verses 16 through 17, the Lord did pour out his spirit upon all the face of the land. As there was a spirit that went forth to prepare the way before the appearance of Christ and the Nephites, so there is a spirit that must go forth to prepare the way before his final return. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Joel said in chapter 2, verses 28 to 31. It's interesting when he refers to pillars of smoke, the actual Hebrew word is a mushroom of smoke, perhaps maybe referring to nuclear warfare that causes mushroom of smoke, not a pillar of smoke. And again, hearken and hear, O inhabitants of the earth, listen, ye elders of my church together, and hear the voice of the Lord, for he called upon all men, and he commandeth every man everywhere to repent. For behold, the Lord God has sent forth the angels, crying through the midst of heaven, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, for the hour of his coming is nigh. Even before the first missionaries of this dispensation went forth, the Lord declared, The field is white, ready to harvest, which we would interpret to mean that the hearts and minds of many have been prepared for this day and this hour. The seed of the gospel will take root and will grow into a mighty oak of the millennial day. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you gain some doctrinal principles and insights that will help you in your spiritual journey towards Christ. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.